So I'm going to invite Mark to come. Awesome. And we're going to pray for him. So yes, can we stretch our hands toward Mark as we pray for him, for the word that his preaching will be as anointed, as good as this first service. Thank you, Father, for everyone who came for this second service. I pray that um, the word that, that will be spoken will touch them and that uh, every heart who are here present, it, the, 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 what Mark is going to say will be seeds of everlasting effect on their lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you. Wow. Super, thank you so much. I, I'm... As I was stood at the back, I was thinking, the Word is just like a mirror, isn't it? Um, and we're going to spend some time in the Word, and it helps us to see ourselves and to um, take stock and say, ah, okay, this is, um, this is God speaking to me now. So I've uh, I, I, I'd given the title of this uh, sermon, Living Our Baptism, um, and... Uh, and uh, I'd like to address the subject of uh, suffering and its place in being our teacher. And uh, when I reflected on the first service, it sort of, you can judge for yourselves whether that's what the subject is or not. But uh, uh, we're going to look in the uh, first epistle of Peter today because he's always terribly practical and uh, straightforward. And uh, very recently, uh, I had the chance to speak at Ian McBeath's funeral. And uh, I quoted also from Peter and the Apostles, and I mentioned the fact that uh, for all of the Apostles, there was, it was absolutely unambiguous that Jesus had risen from the dead. Every single one of them, up to the point of their death, none of them at the point of death said, nah, it was just a story. We made it up. They didn't do that. They were, they were convinced that uh, not only um, that had they witnessed the death of Jesus, but they had uh, witnessed his resurrection too. And uh, he'd been their rabbi, but he was their redeemer. And they knew him. What they weren't quite sure about was when he was going to come back. And that's quite evident from the passage we're going to use for our uh, meditation today and uh, when Peter wrote this which is reckoned to be in the early 60s AD just before Nero put an end to his life um, with the help of Silas he wrote this apparently it's in good Greek or as he wrote the second epistle himself and that was in pretty poor Greek but well, that's neither here nor there um, but he writes uh, in chapter 4 the end of all things is near. Mm, well, okay, well, he thought it would be because Jesus had said, you know, this generation won't pass away. But it proved to be longer. He said, therefore, be clear-minded clear and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. As faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides. So that in all things... God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Now, of course, the early church, they did four things, which we still try and keep doing today, which is prayer together, communion, uh, um, fellowship, and the apostles' teaching. So 
this particular apostle's teaching, uh, if we follow it, what are, the, what are the ways we can see God's kingdom come? So I've got a few points here before we move on. And the first thing is very simple. It's to pray. Be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. And they knew, well, they needed to be really in fellowship, didn't they? Because um, Nero was about to unleash a big persecution, uh, blaming the Christians for the burning of Rome. And, uh, and we know he did horrible things like... Uh, you know, illuminating his garden parties with the burning bodies of crucified Christians. And it was a horrible time. And we know that uh, in the world today, there are some, some very high surveillance societies now. I'm thinking particularly in China where, where you know, every move is monitored, every connection with others is monitored, and uh, you will lose social score if you meet with the wrong people, especially people who are um, God-fearing people. So that was back then. We're moving to a similar situation where we really need to pray, and not just the worshipful and devotional prayers, but really intercessory prayers. And we have to be organized about it, and we need to cultivate these moments where we can, we can redeem the time. And... Uh, if you're a traveler, this is often be a really good occasion to, to do prayer when you're driving. When I'm cycling, I, I always try and uh, use that time to be available to the Holy Spirit so that he can pray through us. And um, we, we need to be intentional too. If we're not in the full flow of family life, which is pretty demanding, really good thing to get into a prayer partnership or a triplet where you can be intentional about interceding for particular situations. So anyway, be creative on that one. That was his first point. What was his second? His, uh, he said, uh, above all, love each other deeply because love cover, covers over a multitude of sins. And it's more than that, isn't it? It's because that's who God is. I mean, we're all here, aren't we? Because at some point in our lives, we've come to realize that we're deeply, deeply loved. And that's who God is. God is love. And, and he wants us to be like him. And so not being in community isn't an option for believers. We cannot do a do-it-yourself faith. We have to be connected. Um, Paul said, didn't he? He said, by one spirit, we're all baptized into one body. All the stuff of faith and life has to be done in community. Uh, and that's awful, isn't it? It's, a, it's terrible that that should be so. Wouldn't it be so much easier if we could just detach ourselves and not have to inter uh, interact with other people, especially if we're introverts rather than extroverts. It would be so much more convenient. But no, that's not even an option because love can only happen in relationship with other people. Hmm. So my question to you is, since God's mission in your life is to make you a better lover... How are you doing compared to a year ago? Where is your heart? Is your heart bigger? Oof. Is your love getting deeper for others? And if it's not, you need to ask yourself the question, why not? Oof. Is it that you haven't made it a priority? Is it that you've been hurt? Is it that you're just going along like, well, this is the rest of my life and this is who I am? But no, God's mission in you is to enlarge your heart. And that goes on till your dying day. Oh. 
It's taken me years. I, I know that compared to other people, I'm just like a toddler. And I sometimes think God sends us to the ends of the earth really to, to, to help us to get over ourselves and get us to love, to get us to love outside of the ease of our own language or outside the ease of our own culture. And it, it begs the question, doesn't it, what is love? And in the first service, I did a little didactic moment and said, okay, what's love? Okay, Sheila, what's love? It's like, it's all to do with others, all to do with God, yes. Yeah, doing good for others, maybe. Yeah, doing good for others. Yeah, it's interesting that to think about what, what actually is love? What, what does it look like in practice? Oof. When I thought about it, I thought actually love is probably fundamentally it's about acceptance, isn't it? Acceptance of the other person. I've been married now 30 years and uh, I didn't get a choice in it. No, no, of course I did. But I accept that Gabrielle is exactly the way she is. That's who she is. And that's who she is, and that's it. And my love for her is in accepting her fully, exactly as she is. Obviously, encourage her to become, you know, the godly version of herself. But it's acceptance, isn't it? And it's listening. If there's no listening, there's no love, really, is there? Really to not just hear, but really listen to the other. And it, I'm not just talking about intimate relations. I'm talking about anybody, really. If we love them, we listen. And the same could be said about kindness, Love without kindness, is it love? <sighs> Can't, I, don't, I don't know that it is, is it? Unless you're kind, is it love? Maybe love is mercy. Being merciful. I've got some work to do on that. <laughs> Still work to do. It's sad, isn't it, that it takes you all your life and just about get there and then it's time to die. But never mind, that's, that's okay. Thankfully, that's uh, the grace of God that he doesn't force us to grow beyond our ability to grow. But if we're God's people, then love is our trajectory, isn't it? And the more you think about love, the more 1 Corinthians 13, or is it 13? I think so. Patient, kind, long-suffering, all these attributes of love. And it's really, that's who God is. So the more we let that love grow in us, the more we're becoming ready to meet the Lord face to face. True. So God's really committed to cha changing us into his likeness. And, and the love part's really important, isn't it? Okay, so that's pray, love. Third thing, serve. Each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So, what is the principal gift you've received? Hmm. That's an interesting question, isn't it? But I'm going to generalize and say, actually, there's one gift that we've all received if we're sat here today together. And that gift is breath. Life. It's a gift. It's such a wonderful gift. That is our life. As soon as that breath is over, we're just a body of no consequence. But as long as we have breath, gifted it day by day, Fantastic. We've received it 
And what are we to use it for? Peter says, and he's at the end of his life, isn't he? He's also gone through the mill a bit, and he's sort of tried to work it all out. And he says, actually, what's it for? It's to serve others. And um, just like we learn to practice hospitality, um, how do you practice hospitality? Well, you have to open, open yourself. You have to make a decision. You say, okay, we're, we're told that that's what we need to do. That's what we need to practice. So, okay, I need to organize myself to do it. I see Jen here, Jen and Eric, they're fantastic at doing that. At our community group, this was wonderful cakes and they're gluten-free because somebody in the group is gluten-free and, and the love is real. The love is cake, I tell you. <laughs> but, um, but how do we do it? Well, we decide we're going to do it, don't we? We decide we're going to do it and we say, well, I'm going to allocate that amount of time or resource to doing it and you do it and that's great. And then you do it again and you do it again, and you do it again, and little by little, it just becomes second nature. It becomes part of who you are, because you've practiced, and practice makes perfect. Or at least it makes it better and better. And it, isn't that the same with serving? I've, I'm sort of going through those Romans 12 gifts now in my life, and thinking, oh, okay, I need to give a few years to these. So I, I've got the privilege of serving my father-in-law, who's sort of right at pretty near the end of his life and he, he needs a lot of help and I'm doing that and it's such a it's a privilege to serve and to give him dignity in what's a pretty undignified phase of his life it's so wonderful it becomes our teacher so so those are, that's the preamble so I just want to think about how did the kingdom, after Pentecost, how did it really spread in those first decades and centuries after Jesus' resurrection? And, you know, it mostly spread one-to-one, -one, from slave to slave, from slave to master, from friend to friend. And the testimony of these early believers was actually as much about the change in their behavior and their attitude of mind as it was about what they said. Because categorically they were different than the, the, than the people around them. First and foremost, they'd lost their fear of death, which was a big deal in the Roman Empire. Many people were afraid, afraid of death. And the second thing is that their whole self-image changed because they'd become ennobled by becoming the sons of God, whether they were male or female, in the sense of the Roman time when uh, sons had all the inheritance rights. That's why I think the apostles talk about us, whether we're male or female, being sons of God. Why? Because whether you're male or female, your inheritance rights are absolutely the same in God. The promises of God are for you irrespective of gender. But thirdly, the, the way they related to others changed significantly. And uh, this change of behavior actually found its origins in Jesus' teaching. And actually in our community group in Sterebate, we've been looking at uh, parts of the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, we've actually looked with new eyes at some of Jesus' teaching. And in particular, Matthew 5.39, where it says, If anyone s strikes you or slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other also. Now, I don't know about you, I, I had years of thinking we're supposed to learn to be doormats you know, to just take it, all that uh, abusive behavior. But no. Anyway, just to go to this particular verse, um, in that civilization which, uh, which had approved of outright slavery rather than covert slavery, ma Roman masters would strike their subordinates with the back of their hand. 
So they would strike somebody on the right cheek with the back of their right hand. And uh, the message was fairly sort of clear and straightforward. Of course, they weren't the only ones hitting. Husbands were hitting wives, and I guess some wives were hitting husbands. And parents would be hitting children. And the, the whole message of this violence was get back in line. Learn to be humiliated. I'm the boss. And actually, Jesus here, when he says, offer the other cheek, he's saying, stand up, look them in the eye, because as a child of God, you are no longer to be degraded and humiliated. That, that is not your calling as a child of God. You have to... Offer the other cheek, look them in the eye, refuse to accept this type of treatment. Assert that you are a child of God too. And we need, to, we need to recalibrate our relationships, don't we, globally? Because actually, some of the really most incredible believers are born in poor countries. And it's a quirk of... Quirk, it's, quirk of birth, isn't it? We can't be too superior for the fact we're born on a tectonic plate where we don't suffer massive earthquakes every 70 years as they do in Chile. I mean, if your economy, or, or if you're born in the Philippines where virtually every year you have some massive tropical storm or an earthquake, or a tsunami, or a volcano that wrecks your settlement and leaves you having to rebuild your life all over again. That's not, that's not a lot of fun, is it? That's not easy. So the fact that if we've been born in, a, in a one place rather than in another, it doesn't give us any grounds for superiority. But that's it. It's a bit how, how the, the apostles, um, they didn't do a big critique on the fact that the Roman Empire was a shocking empire. I mean, it, it thrived by invading and conquering its neighbors. And I, I remember when I was a student, I, 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 the Marxists would always have it in for Christianity, for not not challenging the structural injustices of society. But why didn't they? Because actually, this new kingdom was going to come one to one, person to person. I mean, we happen to be in a period of uh, sort of liberal democracy with free market capitalism. It's secondary to our, our purpose and our interest, which is to see the kingdom of God come in individual lives of the people that we share life with. Hmm. So in this new kingdom, there was to be no superior and subordinate. And Paul, as well as Peter, Paul says this in three of his letters. He says, in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, Congolese nor uh, Croatian, you know. Neither slave nor free. Your economic circumstances are secondary. Live with them. You might improve them, but this is not the issue. In terms of how we relate as people, it's neither male nor female, slave nor free. We're one in Christ, and that's our identity. And of course, the apostle did spend quite a lot of time trying to nuance the relationships between masters and slaves because if slaves became believers and their master was a believer, there was a temptation, wasn't there, that they would just become lazy or disrespectful or presumptuous. And uh, Paul has to, to write that and, and make sure that they, they, they don't abuse the relationship And it, it's quite difficult, isn't it? It takes quite a bit of um, nuancing because 
the kingdom values are not about fight. They're not about some violent retaliation and revenge in the face of injustice. But nor is it about flight. It's not about becoming a doormat and being submissive and passive and uh, take the other cheek, you know, okay, I'm just going to be victimized because that's the way of Christ. No, 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 no. We'll get to what, what that way should be, but I, just as an aside, isn't it interesting that uh, Gandhi, it was thanks to his reading of the Sermon on the Mount that he actually elaborated his, uh, uh, his principle of social change through nonviolence. And he said, the first principle of nonviolent action is that of non-cooperation with anything uh, everything humiliating. That is not our calling to be abused, to be humiliated. We don't accept it. And the early believers learnt to find that third way. Now, obviously, you know, 21st century, context has changed since the apostles wrote what they wrote. And uh, in Belgium, of course, there are still slaves, but the only overt slaves that I can think of are actually trafficked sex workers because they're essentially in slavery. They're, they're, they're a whole subsection of the population that are being abused uh, with, with sort of state legitimization. But there are all sorts of other abusive relationships, aren't there? There are bullies in school. Um, there are families where the power balance is not right. Instead of being 50-50, it's 80-20 or 90-10 between one or other of the, the parties. And that is not kingdom-like. It's not. And there are lots of children who are victims, if not of abuse, certainly of neglect. And my goodness, what an epidemic of fraud is happening in the Western world. Have you noticed? Even this week, I had a phone call from the Belgian Federal Police, supposedly, saying that there was suspicious activity on my card and that if I wanted to avoid prosecution, I had to phone the number. So I phoned the number, and there was a remarkably non-Belgian voice at the other end. And I said, um, so I uh, had a little conversation, and I said, could you identify yourself, please, because you don't sound at all Belgian to me. And they put the phone down. But we have to, we have to not be sort of naive, in a way, and be... Um, be taken for a ride when, uh, when we, we see things like that. So let's call this then uh, following Jesus' path some, somewhere between f fight and flight as Jesus' third way. And uh, in our community group, we were reading an article by a guy called Walter Wink who, who described it as basically it's sort of overcoming our fear and standing our ground. We have to sort of break the cycle of humiliation. We have to be creative about it, find ways to do it. We have to seize the initiative, call out the injustice, meet force with humor. And when I was thinking about examples, even though it's a bit dated, I have to share it because it's a fantastic example of, of a friend of ours who's now in her 80s, but about 10 years ago, she was walking through the center of Brussels and she sees this boy being attacked by a gang of other boys or young men so badly that the guy was clearly, if, if they carried on, he risked being killed. And she's just this Belgian lady, you know, you know, of, she's an artist and a bit of a dignified lady, and she walked up and she said, Albert, what are you doing there? We've been looking everywhere for you. And of course, 
guy. She didn't know if he was called Albert or Antoine or Frederick or George. And they were so surprised, they sort of looked up and she grabbed this guy and basically saved his life just by taking the initiative and doing the right thing. Oof, good story. And exactly the sort of response to evil that Jesus would have advocated, I believe. Um, I was thinking of my own life. Sometimes the Holy Spirit gives you these little moments of inspiration. But uh, when I used to run my own business, I had one client and... um, For some reason, he didn't pay his invoice, so I kept sending him reminders. And after about eight months, his lawyer phoned me up and said, Ah, Mr. Arnett, my client doesn't pay people like you. And I said, I beg your pardon? He said, Ah, but uh, basically, he said, he he intimated that uh, actually his boss knew that it would cost me more to take it through the courts than the value of the invoice. So he would make his money by basically screwing people unjustly. So I said, well, I said, I would like you as his lawyer to tell your client that he's made the wrong choice. And you as his lawyer are going to earn at least as much as I'm owed because right is on my side. And he paid, which was nice. But uh, I was mad because I'd spent eight hours of time, wasted time chasing this loser. In fact, I went to see him. And when I walked in, he said, uh, oh, I said, I beg your pardon. I went, well, I wasn't expecting somebody like you. I mean, I was just stressed, smart for business. Anyway, we got chatting, and uh, he said, so he asked me about my business, and I said, well, you know, actually, as a Christian, I'm in this business just to learn how to live out my faith and uh, how to trust God while doing a good job. And he said, I should really spend more time with my children. And I thought, odd non sequitur, what's all that about? And it was like watching a pack of cards falling in front of my eyes. This guy whose moral world, moral framework was money. Get it by whatever means, because that's what life's all about. Lots and lots of money. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is the most lost person I've ever met. So lost. And I, I was mad about my eight hours of lost time. But anyway, you have to let some things go, don't you? So a final observation is that uh, we be willing to suffer rather than retaliate. This third way. <laughs> Peter even says uh, a little bit earlier, he says, uh, rejoice. I oh, know it's after. Rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ. That's really living our baptism, isn't it? Uh, Okay. And James goes one step further. Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. So we're, we're, we're really peculiar people, aren't we, as these followers of Jesus? Because who wants to embrace trials? But that's how we grow. Let me tell you about one of my little sort of heroes. I haven't met her. I think she's dead now. But she was an English lady called Cecily Saunders. And uh, she was an Anglican. So quite English. And... uh, she became a believer in her early adulthood. And she was a trained nurse. And she thought, ah, I know what my purpose is in life. It's to care for people at the end of the very end of their life. And uh, in order to do what she wanted to do, she had to upgrade to becoming a doctor because she knew that as a nurse nobody you know the the authorities weren't going to listen to her so at the age of 33 she started to do 
her, her medical training took her till she was 40. But hey, seven years. Okay, so she, she trained, became a doctor, and then set about um, creating this safe place where people could end their lives in a caring and loving environment. And that's what gave birth to the, what we call the hospice movement. And the reason I'm telling you this is her key observation was that people entering her, care, uh, entering her care would usually be suffering from one of three types of pain. So either they would be having physical pain, so if they wanted to end their life well, you had to deal with that. And you can medicate, for, you know, you can give pain relief. But often people would be suffering social or spiritual pain, social pain in terms of unresolved relationships that have somehow been flawed and broken, or that they were not reconciled to the love of God. And so her goal in the hospice movement was to, with each person, identify where their pain is, and then address that pain particular to that person. So if the person was Jewish, she'd call in a rabbi, you know, and if they were Catholic, call in a priest. But basically be sensitive to that person and their identity and their needs. Now, the good news for us as baptized followers of Jesus is that we don't have to wait till the end of our lives to address the social and spiritual pain we may be suffering. So, but we have to let suffering be our teacher. And let's let it increase our yieldedness to Christ. Now, as as people who live our baptism, we die to ourselves daily, don't we? We have to, you know, we have to let our ego go and let God deal with our pride and uh, lay down our lives. And of course, when we do that, we can come out the other side, rising in newness of life and in the resurrection life. And what I think John describes so well about out of our hearts will come rivers of living water and I love that. I love that. I, that's what I, I crave to live every day, is to have the, this stream of life. Uh, and so let's live in the resurrection life that with God's grace turns our troubles into an in, invitation to be closer to him. When our life is done and the books are opened, the question will not be, how successful were you at being Jacqueline? We'd all like to be Jacqueline because she's got a big heart. But the point is, our goal is not to be Jacqueline. Our goal is to be us. Our goal is to be the person God's made us to be and to do the specific things that only we can do. Nobody else can live your life. Only you can live your life. Only I can live my life before the Lord. And rather than regretting that your life isn't some other life that you'd rather live, why don't you find the grace to see God in your life and in the particular circle of people that nobody else is meeting but you? It's a good thought, isn't it? Mm. I've got two, two quotes I'd like to share um, just to, to show that this behavioral change in, in the early Christians was real and profound. And, and there was this letter, we don't even know who wrote it, but a guy wrote a letter to a person called Diognetus describing what these Christians were like. And I'd love to read you the whole thing, but I'm not, it's a bit too long. But he, this gives you a flavor of the sort of people that they'd become as followers of the way. He said, they obey the established laws, but in their own lives, they go far beyond what the laws require. They love all men, and by all men are persecuted. They're reviled, that means sort of despised. They're reviled, and yet they bless. When they're affronted, they still pay due respect. When they do good, 
They're punished as evildoers, undergoing an undergoing punishment. They rejoice because they're brought to life. We're really peculiar people, you know, as believers, but that's what we're called to be. This is our culture. This is our identity. Interestingly, in yesterday's Lectio 365 app, which Gabriel and I do in the mornings, um, the writer made the point that by the end of the third century, the number of believers in the Roman Empire had exceeded five million. And they were basically spread through about 65,000 house churches throughout the empire. Uh, that's how it was working. And uh, back in the 1940s, this historian, Will Durant, who I don't think, he's not a believer, but he, he says of this phase of the... Uh, first century after the resurrection, he said, all in all, no more attractive religion has ever been presented to mankind. It offered itself without restriction to all individuals, classes, and nations. It was not limited to one people, like Judaism. By making all men heirs of Christ's victory over death, Christianity announced the basic equality of men and made transiently trivial all differences of earthly degree. Ooh. Into a world sick of brutality, cruelty, oppression, and sexual chaos, it brought a new morality of brotherhood, kindliness, decency, and peace. Ooh, I like that summary. So, well, my hope is that this has made you think and this has refreshed your mind and given you some pointers about uh, how you could respond uh, to, to looking into the mirror of the word today. And I think what would be really good to do I guess, I don't know, is there a prayer team in second service? Maybe there is. Yeah, there is the prayer team. So other stuff, you can uh, pray with somebody. But let's just pray about the fight and flight thing, shall we? Um, you know, to, that we should have the grace of God not to do the fight, to do violent words, to do abusive relationships, say, in our families. And let's pray also when it comes to flight, not to be people who run away or allow ourselves to be doormats or to be un, un, inappropriately submissive, but to really find this third way that would help us to be more like Jesus in our society. Does that sound good? I think that's good. So, shall we pray? Maybe just uh, sit, but open your hands if uh, this is something um, you want to engage with the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you for the grace that we found in your Son. Grace and truth. And I want to thank you, Lord Jesus, that you went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the evil one for God was with you thank you that you had the courage to to teach and encourage things that were non-violent non-violently subversive and we thank you that you went to the cross and that God raised you from death and that nothing has ever been the same again. And we pray, Lord, that the same power that raised you from the dead would, would be at work in our mortal bodies and enable us to have the courage and the grace to find this middle way where we, we're not obnoxious and we're not lawbreakers and we're not abusive and we're not doormats but we have the dignity of knowing that we're sons of God in the legal sense, that we're beloved of our Heavenly Father, 
and that we're empowered by your Holy Spirit to be agents of change in, in our families, in our extended families, in our places of work, in our, in our neighborhoods, and in, in the people that we meet week by week. Have mercy on us, Lord God, because we are weak, we are poor, we are not everything that we, we, we know you would like us to be, but help us to embrace your calling on us and help us to worship you in, in, in the way that we respond. Um, Lord, would you give us the grace this week to recognize uh, when you're bringing this work, uh, this word uh, into our um, into our timeline when you're calling us to do things a bit different to the way we've done them before. And we ask all this in, in all of the grace and authority that's invested in, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, if there are little specifics that um, that, that prayer didn't cover, then don't miss the chance to just pray with somebody because that's a really good thing to do. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So we arrived. Oops. My goodness, sorry. <laughs> so we arrived at the end of uh, the service. Uh, just like uh, Mark said, um, there will be a prayer team. I think so, yeah? Okay. We will be a, the a prayer team on uh, my right side. Uh, that will be there if he needs any prayers uh, concerning what have been said or for other matters. You're free to, to ask for it. And uh, quick instruction before I end this service. Uh, we talk about a lot of subjects today. We talk about love. We talk about uh, serving as well. If you like to serve, you're also free to uh, do so by signing up uh, to a form where we ask people about uh, what ministry they would like to serve. So feel free to do so. And uh, if you are a newcomer and you would like to know more about the church, you can also do this by going to the iPads over there and uh, uh, reg register for the new uh, newsletters or for a connect groups uh, community. You're um, more than welcome to be part of a community. And so that's it. There is nothing more to add. And uh, I'm just going to bless you, everyone, and have a nice uh, week. And, uh, I, will pr I pray that the Holy Spirit will accompany you for this Sunday and for the following days. In Jesus' name, amen.